right, so we have the conversion chart for the tangent vectors, and we have a conversion process for cotangent vectors, and we have a metric tensor which is made out of uh, tensor products of cotangent vectors, and this is linear in both entries, so it acts on two, two tangent vectors. So an example would be, um, suppose we have um, thetas are in uh, 0 to 2 pi, and phi is in 0 to pi. And in this chart, I'm going to require, I'm going to say that G, the metric tensor G, is equal to um, D phi squared. I'm going to write the notation that you'll see. D phi squared actually means D phi tensor product D phi. But people just write D phi squared a lot of the time. Plus sine squared phi d theta tensor product d theta. So maybe Esteban recognizes this. <laughs> what, what, what do you think this is a coordinate chart for? I haven't told you even what the metric space is or anything, but can you guess? It looks familiar, but wait. Uh... So I'll tell you how you figure yeah. it out. You draw this, theta and phi. Okay, we don't have the metric space yet. I'm gonna just draw the chart, the, the mm -hmm. other side of the chart. Theta. Yeah. Sphere, maybe. yeah. Top quarter? The part, top part? Is that a well? It's just the sphere. Um. Here's, my, here's my chart, and I have to map it into my, my metric space. Yeah. What I have to understand is how is this chart distorted and shaped by this metric tensor? And this metric tensor is saying, oh, these lines are all, they're not multiplied, they're actually just length one. Differentiating, sorry, differentiating in this direction is just length one all the time. So these are spaced with parallel lines. But this says that differentiating in the theta direction at the bottom is very close to zero, and at the top is very close to zero. So what it maps this to is a shape like this, where these guys are still parallel. These guys are still parallel because there's no distortion to how they're differentiated. But this one is distorted so that this comes together like a sine curve. And then you can actually check it's exactly the sphere. You can't see for sure that it's the sphere right now, but you can check it's exactly the sphere. But the way they would describe this in a physics class is they would be like, oh, here's a chart, and here's the metric tensor. And I'm not even going to tell you what the metric space is, because in physics, they don't even say metric space. Like, they don't use the term. They just say, put together these charts and glue them. And what are you doing? You're making a metric space. But they're not telling you that. They're just saying, oh, here, here's a chart, and here's how it's distorted. And now if you need another chart, this one isn't quite reaching the top and the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. OK, so you might need another chart for the top and the bottom, and you just have to double check the G transformation formula works. But this would be enough for physicists, because they're like, oh, we got almost everything. Who cares about a couple points? Yeah. And then they get worried and they check it and they are, oh no, this one's okay. It really does smooth. And then sometimes the point does something like this. When they try to fill it in, it's not smooth. There's no chart. And then they call that a singularity, right? Because there's no smooth chart there. All right, so that's a sample. And then um, Uh, so that's just an example. So let me think for one second. What was I going to say? Oh, yes. So the next thing we have to do is get back to the metric space because we kind of didn't tie the metric space to the to the metric tensor yet. And they actually tie together. So once you have this um, metric tensor, you can define, you can relate the metric tensor back to the metric space in the first place. Let me just uh, photo this. Then I will show you what I mean. I really cannot get things without shadows. Okay. 
a race one sample. I don't know how to make myself the one that I see. In the video? I'm not seeing myself. Pin video. Yes, thank you. Okay. Really not really good for you guys to read this. It's terrible. I hope you see it better than I do. Oh, got my scarf there falling off. All right. <laughs> see, this is my, uh, my purpose. Oh. But if someone walks in the door, I. I'm wearing <laughs> it's easier than, than wearing a mask. Yeah. <laughs> and they fall right off, you know, all the time. So yeah. scarf is better. All right. So um okay. So now we have this thing, and now we want to tie back to the metric space. So once we have this metric vector, we can define the length of a curve. So now we can define the length of a curve. The length of a curve. So the length of the curve actually depends on the metric tensor. So you put a little subscript. No shadows on it. L sub G of a curve from say zero to one. Is the integral from zero to one of g d prime of t d prime of t dt, and we have to take it to the one half power because mm -hmm. remember it's like squared. So this is like the norm. Okay. okay. So it's the dot product, c prime of c prime, dot product, and half power to get the length. This is the norm of the vector, and then you integrate the norm. That's the length of a curve now. So that means that every single curve that has um, that's differentiable, we can now define g c prime c prime, and then we can integrate that. Okay, so no problem. And then we define the distance, the distance function on our metric space. So we had a metric space to start with, and we call that metric space the Hamiltonian manifold. If the distance matches the distance of the metric space and the distance between two points should equal the infimum of all the lengths of curves such that C at zero is P and C at one is Q. So you'd start with your two points, P and Q. And you look at all possible curves going between them. You mm -hmm. check all their lengths. And the shortest length, if it actually exists, is the distance between them. Otherwise, you need an infimum because it might not exist. OK, you might just get closer and closer to it. So you could say it's a minimum if it's a special kind of uh, metric space called a compact metric space. But it's an infimum in general, just in case there was a hole somewhere. You know, so we, we, we have this and we take the shortest length between any points. And then that gives you exactly the standard distance on a sphere. So if you have that metric tensor on the sphere and you found out the lengths between of curves that will match the lengths on a sphere, and then if you take this distance, you would find it's the arc length distance between points. If you infimum them over all curves, you'll find the shortest path is to take the arc length. And you can do this. How would you find this infimum? You would do this integration, but you would keep track of C more general, like general C's, and say, oh, what can I do? I can show it's bigger than or equal to this, and bigger, oh, it's bigger than or equal to arc length. And then show, oh, well, there is a curve that is the arc length. So that's how you would do a proof of something like this. So we put all this together, and we say a Ramanian manifold. A Ramanian manifold is a metric space that has charts, so it's a manifold, and it has a metric tensor that is positive definite, defined at every single point using charts, using this conversion process, so that we can define lengths of curves. The curves don't have to stay inside one chart. As they move from one chart to the next, you use different 
different metric tensors different representations of the metric tensor in the different parts. And then we take the integral of length of curves, and that gives us the distance of our metric space right back. That's a Riemannian manifold. The definition says that the distance you get at the end is the distance you had at the beginning. All right, so you could check, like for homework, a very difficult homework, you could check the sphere. Now, it's a very difficult homework if you do things very abstract. And it's not so difficult if you use the fact that the sphere is a submanifold of R of R3. Okay? If you use that the sphere is a submanifold of R3, all of this is kind of quick. But if you try to do it completely abstractly and never use it sitting inside R3, then this is difficult to show us the same. Okay? But it's it's a good one to look at. All right, and let's see how much time do we have? It's 2.15 already. So let me just show you one cool one. And then uh, we'll stop and we can just chat. The cool one I wanted to show you is on my phone. Second. Once. One more very nice example that comes from physics. Is this too shiny? Oh, it's not too bad. So now our chart is R2 with the origin removed. Take away zero. Okay, so now we're taking all of R2 as our chart. Oh, sorry, R3. But I have to erase the origin. I'm not going to have my chart define at the origin. And then I'm going to make my metric tensor G, my metric tensor G is going to equal, and I'm going to use the physics notation, chi psi squared dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus dx3 squared. So unlike on the sphere where we only changed one of the or one of the directions was distorted by sine. On this space, all three of them distorted by the same amount. That's actually called a conformal change if you change all three of the same amount. So this is what's called conformally flat. This is the standard. This is the standard Euclidean. Standard Euclidean metric, because these three things are perpendicular to each other and their unit length. So that matches. And now we've changed it by this conformal factor. Conformal factor, it's called. Because it factors in front of all everything. And then we say, I'm going to tell you exactly what chi and psi are. They're formulas from physics. So let me give them to you. Chi is equal to 1 plus m over r and psi is equal to 1 plus m over r. Um, I made a very simple pair. There are more complicated chi and psi to choose. Let me just make sure I did the right m. Sorry, m over 2r. So you see that this is not defined at the origin because the radius at the origin is zero. So r equals here, where r is the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. So what this, this um, g is doing is it's saying, OK, I start with like Euclidean, but my radial direction, my radial direction When r reaches m over 2, at that sphere where r equals m over 2, this will be, um, so sphere, at the sphere r equals m over 2, it's going to be similar to twice the Euclidean lengths. But if I go in, it starts becoming very large. 
So distances in here are very large. In fact, they're as large as a corresponding distance using a one over for our map. So this sphere is the same size as that one. It's very strange. I can do them in color so you get a sense. The blue sphere in here is exactly the same size as this one. If 1 plus m over 2r agrees for both of them, they're exactly the same size. And then we have an inner sphere even smaller. And this sphere is exactly the same size as a much larger sphere around that. So actually, this, this space is the same. The way it's behaving towards infinity is exactly the same as the way it's behaving towards zero. And you can sort of picture it if you drop the three dimensions. If you think of this as only two dimensional, you can picture this as something like this shape. Each one of these is a sphere, actually. So that this black one here, where it matched perfectly, that's this one. And then the blue ones, where it started getting larger again, could be here. And then the green ones, where it was getting even larger, is here. And this may be going to infinity, r to infinity. And this direction is r to zero, and it's absolutely symmetric. You can show that you can make a, a symmetric map by switching by, I think it's r, r goes to 4 over r, something like that, depending on the m. All right, so does this look like, um, <laughs> so some of you had looked in your submanifolds at a space that had a parabola shape over here. So actually, this is that. So it actually works out that this is a submanifold in r4, where this is a parabola rotated around this axis. So it actually agrees that it can be seen as a submanifold. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is um, this space was discovered by somebody. Um, does anyone guess what it is? The M is a hint. M? The M is a hint. What, what kind of space do you think this might be? Is that me? <laughs> Minkowski? No. Huh? It's M for mass. This is a black hole. This is a Ramanian black hole. Now, in the space time, there's another time direction to it, which is not drawn here. This is a space like view of the universe around a black mm -hmm. hole. And M yeah. is the mass of that black hole. And in the Ramanian, if you're just taking a, a space-like slice of the universe and you're not worrying about time moving forward and back, mm -hmm. a black hole is the same inside and out. And the horizon of the black hole is this, or it's called the apparent horizon. Mm. Now, when you add the time direction, it's not symmetric anymore. One direction, the light can't escape, and the other direction, the light moves out. Okay? Yeah. That, the escaping of light has time factor going on. But this is a Ramanian black hole. And what's even cooler is that you can also do much more conformal factors. This is this is basic one. This is the Ramanian Schwarzschild. And it actually has scale of curvature equal to zero. You can do the same thing, but you can change your warping factor, and you can have lots of punctured holes. You can go plus the first mass over two times the distance to that hole, plus another mass over two times the distance to another hole, and so on. And you can have many holes, so you can also do the same thing where the warping factor has is different. It's a one plus a sum over different masses for different black holes, and you end up and psi is the same as chi. And you end up with what space looks like with a lot of black holes. Now, these are black holes that are standing still, and they haven't started moving yet, because we're no, there's no time. So that's called real Lindquist space, if you add in all these black holes. And it actually a solution, solves the equations. And then one more thing, 
is if you don't match this M and this M, and you have slightly different letters, then the sum of them is the mass of the black hole, and the difference of them is the charge, the electric charge of the black hole, which is really cool. Yeah. And you can show that the Laplacian of this function has nice properties. You'll see, actually, if you've looked at, uh, if you take a portion of the French equations, like kind of where these functions come from. So that's a kind of a neat thing. You can arrange the black holes where you want them to be. You can set them up in, in, in different ways and just sort of test case the scenario. Just remember that none of the black holes are moving. This is a still picture. We don't actually have a formula that describes a bunch of black holes or even two precisely with the time direction included. We have numerics that know how black holes spin together and numerics that describe that gravitational waves that come out, but it's too complicated. Nobody has yet written down a formula for space time once they start moving. This is just like an initial time. Yeah. One moment right before they all start moving. And so this is sometimes used for the initial data when they run the numerics. They start with this Berlinquist. They put um, one big black hole and one little one. They solve for these formulas. They get exactly how space time is bent by them. And then they say, start numerics, see what happens, how they spiral together. So when you look at the, um, when they talk about black holes colliding and you see videos, that's numerics. That's numerically done. So, how do you write for Linko? How do you, Brill Linquist. But this isn't only theirs. I mean, a lot of people did this. They just didn't know. So to be fair, anyway, Brill and Linquist have a good paper that's very readable about it. And um, what this solves is what's called the Einstein-Maxwell equations because it does have charge. If, the, if these two letters are the same, they're just zero charge. Black holes have no charge. Mm. But it's kind of interesting. So it's something you might have fun. You can ask me questions now if you want, and I'll draw pictures. You can ask me things about it. But the idea is that by having this conformal factor, they were able to set things up. They solved the partial differential equations. This made it easier because it's just one function in front of three things. That's assuming it's conformal. You know how when you do partial differential equations, sometimes you say, oh, assume it's rotation symmetric, or assume this, or Assume it's conformal so you can turn it into an ordinary differential equation. This one is still a partial differential equation. It still is because it's still got all the partial derivatives for x1, x2, and x3, but it's so similar to Maxwell's equations that they can solve it. Mm. Um, but usually when you solve Einstein equations, you're figuring out g, i, j. So that is nine entries, but the symmetric opposite ones agree. It's a system of PDEs. That's why it's so hard mm -hmm. to work with. But this is a nice one that you guys can, and you can read the, the Berlinquist paper is kind of cool. It's from 1963, and they were already doing a little bit of numerics. <laughs> because as soon as they put in two black holes, they didn't know where the horizons were. So the horizon, they didn't know where it would be once there were two holes, because they're no longer circular shapes. This one you can sort of see is not a narrowest point. And when there's two holes, it starts looking like it starts. Starts looking like this. There's a hole here and there's a hole here. And they didn't know when does that make two necks? And when does that do something like this? Well, it's, it's like three maybe. When do these sort of split after? So they ran some numerics to figure out uh, certain situations gave it so that these two were actually inside a bigger black hole. Um, you can't see that. But when are these two black holes inside a big one? When have they merged or not is the question. And so they did some numerics to see, given if it was exactly this formula, then when were these two inside a big black hole? When weren't they? And then uh, Professor Stavrov and I did a paper where we proved some theorems about when they're merged. 
because they only had done the numerics. Right? And there's still so many open questions. It's like a really cool open question that hasn't even been looked at numerically is what if you have a whole lot of black holes lining up in a ring? Like a whole lot of them. Then what happens? Do they all merge together? And all yeah. Imagine if they collide. Well, we don't have time, so we can't talk about yeah. the action of colliding. We can only yeah. say collided or merged or not merged. Right? But to move forward in time and talk about collide, yeah. that's the numerics law. Yeah. But they but there's beautiful um, numerics now, you can look them look at them. Um, showing yeah. how they spiral together. Awesome. So, some of them are at the same center for geometry and physics. Um, the meeting is ending in 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, as a, um, a seminar at the uh, grad center. Did you get the emails about that? I am not sure, Professor. I, I, I have seen so many emails. I, I am not sure okay. if I have it. I'll send everybody an email right now with okay. the link for the seminar at the grad center. Um, Raquel Perales is speaking. She's Mexican. Um, she can speak because it's a long distance, um, you know, yeah. it's virtual anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, was, she was my student at Stony Brook, my doctoral student at Stony Brook. Um, how is it already? Four years, five years ago. But anyway, she's giving the talk today. So I'll definitely send it to you so you can see. She'll be talking about Ramani and geometry and metric spaces. So. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Bye, thank everybody. You. Have a good one, Professor. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Professor. Bye. Bye. Bye.